our third week of our series called 316, where we are preparing ourselves to study one verse from the mouth of Jesus that I truly believe, whether you're a new Christian, non-Christian, anti-Christian, can radically change your life. Now, in order to get to John chapter 3, verse 16, we have to do some legwork because there are 15 verses preceding it. And so for the last two weeks, uh, minus last week because of Minister Josh's word, hey, come on in, come on in. We have been um, studying these first 15 verses. And in doing so, what I hope you and I and collectively us, what we have been learning is that uh, what we have been collectively learning is, number one, the nature of uh, mankind, uh, number two, the nature of God, and number three, the nature of salvation, which is what we'll talk about today. But my hope is that in these 15 verses, what the Spirit is doing in your heart and mind is sort of tilling the soil and preparing to plant uh, a radically powerful, potent seed in the, the form and fashion of John 3.16. And so... With that said, let's, uh, if you have a device, you can open it up yourselves or just fall off the screen. If you're at home, please read along with us as we read again, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these, uh, do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? What? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirits, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And so in week one of our series, we learn that uh, in the groundwork Jesus gives us, 4, 3, 16, in verses 1 through 15, he first and foremost teaches us about the nature of mankind. We, we talked about how this guy Nicodemus is not called the ruler of some Jewish people, but he, it says that he's the ruler of the Jews. And so that means, like I said a couple weeks ago, that's like saying Bill is the ruler or leader of the Americans. It, it means that this person had national influence. He must have been incredibly well-respected, not just well-known. He must have been really well educated, um, probably affluent in some sense or another. And yet, how does John describe Nicodemus? Does he call Nicodemus this potent, incredible titan of his time? Twice, John says, then a man, just a man, just a man and Nicodemus. I know that some, it's tempting to assume Nicodemus is all that in a bag of chips, but no, he's just a man. And so the first thing that you and I really need to digest and download into our hearts to get to 316 is first and foremost, you and I, we're just, we're just people, we're just men. We are not, in other words, God. You and I, I have to repeat this again because it's astounding information, right? You, you are not God. Now, you, you may sit there and be like, well, I know that. I, I already, of course, I know that. But let, hear me again. You are not God. And if you want an example or a few examples of why Jesus emphatically pushes this point as a preliminary point to 316. Imagine that you found $20 in your pocket, right? Oh, this is the best day ever. And now imagine what if I or your friend told you how and how you cannot spend that $20? Would you listen to that person? No, of course not. Because that $20 that you magically found, you automatically assume is yours. It's almost as if by finding that $20 and owning it for yourself, you're like saying, this is, this is mine now. No one can tell me how to use it or not use it. I am sort of the highest authority when it comes to how to use my money. Some of you are in high school. What if, what if one day you come to church or maybe a friend who loves you comes to you and says, hey, I don't think you should be dating that person or uh, I don't think it's smart to be hanging out with these kinds of people. 
what is our visceral reaction? Our reaction for many of us is, who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to tell me who to date and who not to date? Who to hang out with, who not to hang out with? Am I not the highest authority when it comes to decisions like that? So when, 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 I, when Jesus teaches, hey, the nature of mankind is that you are not God, it sounds like basic elementary information, but it's information we have to be reminded of over and over and over again, even though it feels like at times you are the captain of your fate. You're the master of your soul. The reality is you're not. As little control as you had over being born in the century you were born with the hair color that you have, so you are not in control of your life the way that many of us assume that we are. We are not God. And then in the second week of our series, we talked about not only the nature of mankind, but the nature of God, that the nature of mankind is so not godly that the only way for someone who is a, a person made in mankind to connect with God is if God connects with us, if somehow God came and connected with us. And so in that second week, we talked about how the nature of God is single fold. The only way to know God is to know Jesus because no one knows God other than Jesus. And the reason no one knows God like Jesus is because Jesus is God. And so in that second week, we discovered that though I am not God and so far from him and I can never connect to him, thankfully, there's a way by which God has made for God to connect to me and that way is named Jesus. And we learned that this Jesus is a kind of a God who doesn't wait for you to come into the light, but he reaches after you while you are in the dark. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, not in broad daylight, but he comes to him at night because he's ashamed. He's ashamed to be seen with Jesus in public. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him for it. Jesus doesn't say, how dare you? He says, no, while you are still in the dark, while you are, as Paul says, a sinner, there I will meet you. I don't want you to get your act together and then come to church and then pray. When your act is most untogether, that's where I'm going to meet you. That's where I want to reach you. And so today, that leads us to the third sort of main point of these first 15 verses in preparation for 316, and that is what, what happens and how does God achieve, how does Jesus achieve the process of transferring us, meeting us in the dark, and then transferring us from the dark into the light. And much like last week and the weeks prior, rather, uh, there's a couple of points here. But let's start with, first and foremost, going back to the text, Jesus says to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I want you to notice, Jesus doesn't say, unless someone really, really works hard, Unless someone goes to graduate school, unless someone sells everything and lives on a mountainside, then he, he or she can see the kingdom of God. No, he says, unless someone is born again. This is radical, radical language. In fact, he continues on that idea saying over and over again, you have to be born again. You have to be reborn. In other words, the first aspect of the nature of salvation is that salvation is not something that you can earn. It's something that is given to you. Much like you didn't earn your gender. Did you know that? <laughs> you didn't earn your hair color. You didn't earn the shape of your nose. Those were just given to you by your parents. They were given to you by someone else. You didn't earn your race. It was just given to you. And in the same way, Salvation is something you don't earn, but it's given to you by being born again. That's why he uses this rebirthing language, because salvation is not self-improvement. It's not some kind of means of uh, methodology for a better life or more emotional mental health, although certainly those are the fruits of it. Rather, salvation is a radical transformation of your life that is not earned, but it's given. Secondly, Jesus also says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And again, he emphasizes spirit. The spirit is spirit. And so it is, and as an illustration of that, he points to the wind and he says, so it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. 
And so this second birth that is given and not earned, that is gifted and not gained, it's given by the Spirit. Now, for some of us, there's this narrative that many of you have assumed that those things which you can taste, touch, see, hear, right, those things are the most real things. And when we start talking about spiritual things, that's when we're talking about not as real, not as true things, right? No, you're fine. You're fine. But let me p- posit this for you, okay? Prior to your tastes, your touch, your hearing, your vision, what was there? What was there prior to your senses, if not spirit? In other words, if we're thinking about like a Venn diagram, I think a lot of people, they have one circle that's like the flesh or the physical world and one diagram that's like the spirit. And sometimes if you go to church, they overlap. That's not what scripture says. That's not what Jesus says. Rather, if we're thinking about circles, it's one circle is spirit. And then much less than that, inside of that circle are senses, the real world, as many of us assume it to be. And so if this rebirth is given to us by the spirit, do you know what that means? That means it's a kind of rebirth. It's a kind of transformation that is almost beyond replicability. That's not a word, is it? It cannot be replicated by your senses. It cannot be um, copied. It cannot be uh, faked. It is something that is outside of even your five senses. It's a kind of transformation that exclusively comes from something so radically bigger than you, like the spirit. And therefore, the last aspect of the nature of salvation that Jesus teaches us in these 15 verses is that it is evident by radical change. See, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks about this man who comes to Jesus in the dark. And to till the soil of his soul for 316, to get him ready for the radical power and promises sealed in this, in this one verse, John chapter 3, verse 16, he carefully walks him through these 15 verses. He dialogues with him in these 15 verses. In doing so, he's teaching him about the nature of mankind, the nature of God, the nature of salvation, so that when he does drop 316 on him, it powerfully changes him. And if you continue reading the Gospel of John, do you know what you see? You see exactly that. See, in John chapter 19, Jesus has just been crucified in public before the entire city in front of everyone. There's no way to hide the fact that he has been crucified. And there, after he gives up his last breath, John writes, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate, for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away and listened carefully. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. You can't hide that stuff. You have to, it's pretty public and visible what this guy is bringing and what this guy is doing. This is the same guy who just in chapter three was ashamed to be seen with Jesus. And then with the mic drop of 316, with his heart and his soul radically convicted by verses one through 15, you see radical change. And you see this change all throughout scripture. You see a man named Saul who radically persecuted the church. And then he discovers Jesus, the truths of Jesus, epitomized in a vision on a a road to Damascus. And suddenly he's transformed. In Romans 1, he says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who also in Rome, for I am not ashamed. This is a man who's been transformed. You see a couple of brothers, particularly one named James, the son of Zebedee, who uses Jesus for his personal gain. He says to Jesus, hey, just just say yes to whatever I ask, to to what what I'm about to ask you. Please just, will you just promise that you'll do what I ask you to do? Which is incredibly selfish, right? It's essentially saying to Jesus, hey, I'm really just following you for your stuff, not for you. And then he experiences the, the Jesus of John 3, 16, 
And then in Acts 12, Luke writes about the time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church, to the way of Jesus, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. This is a man who once selfishly used Jesus is now selflessly giving his life for Jesus because he's been transformed. Myself, been radically transformed. I told you my story too in middle school, dealing and doing drugs, and here today, radically transformed. And some of you, I know, in your hearts, this is what you want. This is what you've been looking for. This is what you're thirsty and starving for, is a kind of transformation that you can't replicate with your senses, with your taste, touch, sense, with your mind, and with just your emotions. You're searching for a radical transformation that you cannot produce on your own and enter the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Why are we going to study 316 one verse for a couple of weeks? Because I believe truly, much like I did for me, for all these people in scripture, for millions and billions throughout the world and history, it can radically change your life. And that's what we'll pick up next week. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for the good news of Jesus, who is not just somebody who knows God, but knows God because he is God. And though we are so far from being God, we are so in many ways godless, Jesus came down in the form of a person to connect with me, with us, and to do more than just connect, but to covenant, to fellowship himself eternally with us, to produce within us a kind of radical transformation that we could never produce on our own. And Father, for those of us in this room right now who have been starving, who have been searching for that kind of transformation, for that kind of newness, Lord, I pray, would you use your word today and the, and the word to be preached in the weeks to come to produce that kind of transformation in each of us so that the blind can see, so that the lame could walk, so that the lost would be found, so that the dead would live all because and for Jesus. And so now as we respond and worship, would you remind us through this song, help us to confess using this song, our deepest desire to want that transformation, the transformation that comes exclusively by means of Jesus. It's in your name we pray.